Oh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Prime Time at the DU Library. I'm Barrett Fisher, acting dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, celebrating learning beyond the classroom through the experiences and accomplishments of Bethel faculty, students, and staff is what Prime Time in the Library is all about. It's a collaborative project between the friends of Beth the DU Library, faculty development, and many other offices on campus. You can find upcoming primetime events on the library, library's website, the news and events calendar. And if you missed a presentation, most are recorded, which is what I'm doing now, and can be viewed online in the BU Digital Library, which is also found on the library website homepage. Uh, looking ahead to next week on Tuesday, April 1st, the Friends of the BU Library invite you to celebrate their annual awarding of the Library Research Prize and Connie Larson Memorial Scholarship. Danielle Becker, this year's winner of the Library Research Prize, will present Cochlear Implants, Language Acquisition and Speech Intelligibility, the Effect of Age and Implantation. So today we welcome Natalie Beezer, the Director of Disability Services, who will challenge our ideas about disability with her presentation entitled Challenging the Disability Paradigm, Disability as Part of Diversity and Reconciliation. Can everybody hear me okay, right? Good, good. So as a first disclaimer, I chew gum. And the reason why I do that is to keep me focused so that I don't, because I'm very passionate about this topic. And so I um, just wanted to throw that out there. I'm not being disrespectful because I know in some cultures that may seem that way. Um, but I just really want to thank you guys for coming today. Um, so. I wanted to share a little bit about some of the things that I've been doing and I also want to give a really special thank you for the people that work with me in my office. So a lot of times people hear about Natalie and Disability Resources and Services, but I couldn't do what I do without Liz, who is, um, and you can wave to everybody, Liz. Liz is the accommodations coordinator. So I meet with people and say, this is the accommodation, and she does everything else. <laughs> so she makes it all happen. And then this semester, we've been very, very blessed to have three very enthusiastic interns that have been working with us to make a lot of the stuff that has been happening this week uh, and about um, DAG, which is our disability awareness group, um, and events possible. And Kitty Leiter is a senior who will be graduating, and um, she actually is very instrumental in a lot of that. So thank both of you. So I have a lot of information. So the thing is, my goal is to try to get through all of it. So I might skip through a couple of things. I left the objectives up here um, so you could see them. And I typically do this act, do this activity, but because of how we're set up right now, I, I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to do is explain a little bit what this is. Typically, when I make this presentation, it's really to address what are the assumptions that we make about people with disabilities? Because typically I ask people to take out a piece of paper and just to pick a couple of things that you think identify a person with a disability. Then I ask the people that do this to stand up and throw the paper around and then you gotta go pick it up and have to read what it says. And some of the assumptions that I make when I do this activity is that people actually know what those words mean or they can actually bend and pick stuff up or they can read what's on the paper. So many assumptions, and a lot of times we make a lot of assumptions about, about disabilities. So what I wanted to do is address some of the frames that we have about disabilities. And what are some of the things that, that really make those frames? So the first thing, and one that I really am a strong proponent about, is the language that we use. And I'm going to go into these in a little bit more detail. So these are just the five things. The other one is the images that we see in the media. And what are the social structures that are already set up and established? Um, that some of us, that we grew up seeing them. So what do, what do those mean? Um, the design of some of our buildings. Even here at Bethel, there are some parts of Bethel, if you're a wheelchair user, you have to do some navigating about some of those things. So all those are in the design there. And then the last one is the fear. Many people, many that I talk with, so we have a person in a wheelchair, a person who is blind, and you're like, I don't know how to communicate with them. And a lot of it is your fear because you don't want to be offensive, and you're not sure necessarily how to interact with them. So 
that comes in to play in um, some of the, con based on what we see on the media and see and hear, um, just kind of as we com continue forward. So I have kind of five frames. So typically we hear when um, somebody with a disability, if you're, well, I'm a, I'm a mom of two boys with a disability. Um, my boys are on the autism spectrum. And sometimes I hear, or even, um, even with, the, I don't know how many of you were in chapel yesterday, but you get this, oh my, I'm so sorry for you, when you hear that there's a disability, and how can I help you? And particularly in Minnesota, I don't know if you've heard about the Minnesota Nice, but that's our tendency. We, t we want to be helpful, but what does that mean for a person with a disability? And that is going to really lead into what our construct of disability is. Because we think, we think well, you're broken, so I have to help you. And I'm going to propose that that's not necessarily the case. So here is the second frame that we use. The second one is that person with a disability, is, they're somewhat comical, somewhat childlike. I just recently did my taxes. And one of the things the agent said, well, because my son is on disability, and she said, well, he'll be with you for the rest of your life. And I'm like, no, he's not. I don't want him with me for the rest of my life. And if I ask him, he will say, I don't want to be with you for the rest of my life. <laughs> and my husband is in the back. He's smiling because he knows that's true. Um, the other thing that they say is, and a lot of it is not even verbal. It's a lot of it is the attitudes and how they present. And um, is that they're incompetent. For some reason, a person with a disability, learning disability in college, really? How does that work? You know, and so those are some of the things that we see. And a lot of it is from media. So who's seen Forrest Gump before? Many of us love that movie, and I love that movie too. But what it shows is this person with this disability who did these great feats, with, where there are many, but also shows that didn't speak very well, didn't have very good cognitive development, all those things. And those are the images that we see. Um, and so I'm a movie lover, and I love these kind of movies. Um, so these are some of the ones, Mozart and the Will, is that these, are, these are actually um, representations of two people, um, Jim, Jim Port, who is on, on the autism spectrum, and they actually, he writes several books about autism, and they're both um, on the spectrum, and they're married and have children. And so. Um, so here's the other one that we see a lot. It's, um, well, it's better off being dead than disabled. So, and I'm using this as an example because you see this great picture of this beautiful young woman before her accident, right? And then you see this, it doesn't even look like a human being, the portrayal of what happened. So it's better off that that person would have died. And that's the message that we send when we see advertising and stuff like that represented in our media. But luckily, I don't know if you guys are noticing that and how many really watch television, but a lot of those images are changing a lot. And I'm seeing more and more commercials with people who are very happy to show their, you know, the things that we consider to be, well, that doesn't make you normal. And so some of those things are changing. The other thing that we see for some reason, and particularly now when we're hearing a lot about school shootings and things like that, they always have a mental health disability. And I'm not saying that that is not true, but there are other factors that come into play. Um, and that's what we hear, that something has to be wrong with you for you to go into a uh, school and shoot it up or whatever. And so those are the negative images. You hear somebody, they come in and you're scared when somebody, that's, you know, particularly those with mental health disorders, particularly those with, who, who have uh, struggle with like bipolar or depression or things like that, they're so skeptical about disclosing information like this because immediately we go to, okay, what are you going to do? Are you going to bring a gun? Or are you going to do this? And so those images and those representations that we hear, those are the things that kind of frame what those things are. Um, and then this is where a lot of, so we kind of get, kind of in my field, you get two, two ends. What do you do? And I say I work in disability resources, I get the first one. Oh, I'm so sorry, you know? Or, you're so great to do this for these people. And 
There are so, so many amazing people with disabilities that are doing so much phenomenal things. And some of them we know. And like I t you can tell that I like watching television. So all these are famous, somewhat people with disabilities who are doing some really great things. And I know you guys, well, I should assume that most of you know who Stephen Hawking is. And if you just look at, at a picture of him, you're, what, what could he do? But he is changing the course of what disability is. He is on the World Health Organization. Um, he actually created a 2011 report on disability, which is where I get a lot of my statistics and stuff from. So let's talk about the two frames. Right now, and even before, you know, in the 70s and 1960s, 1700s, 1600s, this was the model. And it's still the model in some places and in a lot of developing countries. Um, that disability is actually a deficit. There is something wrong with you. Um, you're abnormal, you're negative, you're less than human, right? And the problem resides in that person. So those persons, not even, they don't even have a name. So probably in America they would say, well, that deaf girl or that blind student. In Antigua, where I'm from, Deaf people don't even have names. They call them dummy. And that used to really get me irritated because it, the, the language that we use and the label that we use, those are the things that frame the type of life that these people endure and have. So now with, with this frame that the deficit is the individual, that, that's what defines that individual as deaf or blind. And then the intervention agent, the person that's going to help and fix you, is the teacher, the, the doctor who's going to give you the hearing aids or any of those things. Those are the things that are going to fix the deficit. But I want to propose to you a new model, which is the social progressive model, which is where it's leading. I'm a member of the HEAD, which is the Association for Higher Education and Disability. And we have, um, this is a national organization with individuals just like me who do this, not in, in college settings, but we're also in, in very involved in the legislation and the laws and things like that. So this model is kind of giving you a different shift, a different understanding of what a disability is. A disability is simply a difference. And some of the differences we see and some we can't see, right? And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. So the condition itself is neutral. So you have ADHD. Many people have ADHD, but that doesn't mean that how you, um, the things that limit you as a result of your ADHD are the same with everyone. And so the limitation is within the environment. So some examples of the environment, the environments are what creates the barriers. So for a blind person, and they need to navigate a website without having access to a screen reader, that's the barrier. So we have to address the barrier. For a person who is deaf and they're in a setting like this, and without an interpreter, that's the barrier because there's a communication barrier. So those are the, the things within the environment that needs to be adjusted. And those are the things that need to change. And as opposed to the model where the teacher or the doctor is fixing the disability, the intervention agent is now anyone who can create stuff that can address the barriers. So many IT, there are like millions and millions of apps to do things now. And the goal for those is so that individuals with disabilities can become, can be independent and do things without help. And that's the goal. Most people that I talk to, probably like 99%, they want to be able to do things independently. And they generally oppose to what we typically hear that we're having to do all this stuff, all this accommodations, they work three times as hard. And they're the ones that staying up all night to get this two-page or three-page paper done. And many of them are leaving Bethel with almost 4.0 GBAs and landing these great jobs. But we don't see that. We don't talk about that. We talk about all the deficits, all the things that we need to accommodate and help. So. And hopefully, I should be setting my timer. I told you I could talk a lot on this subject. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what disability is, because that was a big discussion. 
So you guys know what the ADA is, which is the law that was established um, in 1998 um, that really talked about, 1978, sorry, that talked about what discrimination was and things like that. But this is what we faced when the ADA was established. So who has a disability? Who qualifies? And so there was so much discussion. Is a person with a mental health disorder disabled? And I, and so those are some of the things that they had a discussion. And so the ADA met, uh, well, organizers or group met, and in 2008 they created a, an amendment. And this is what the amendment, and I actually looked in the dictionary too because it was crazy how they termed what a disability was. But now this is the definition of a disability. It's a person with a mental or physical condition that substantially limits a major life activity. So now when you think about that, major life activity, that's a lot of stuff. And I'm going to show you what those include. The second one is that they are regarded as having a disability. So say, for example, you have a person who was diagnosed with cancer, went through chemotherapy, took some time off, and came back to work, and you still treat them like they have cancer. Guess what? They are covered under the ADA because that's how you determine them to be. So this is major life activities. Now, we all do all this stuff, correct? So what the, the sections that are in blue represent the things that they added. Because all these, we all do these, but they're how they limit us, particularly the concentrating, thinking, communicating, those are the things that affect us in higher education. And so for some students, sitting with a textbook for 10 hours and coming out not getting anything, that's a barrier. So how do we address that? That's where we need the need for accommodations. Or we have some students, and I'm one of those, who I cannot sit and listen to a lecture and take notes at the same time, because neither makes sense. Because I will start writing notes, and I forgot what they said. So then I turn back to the instructor, and he's already gone on. So I've missed both things. So, and sometimes we see students sitting in a classroom and not doing anything, but all the energy that they have is focused on listening. So, because, I, and I, I don't know if many of you know that, but I, I did mention it before that I'm from Antigua, and so I'm from a developing country. And so I'm very interested in not only in, um, in America and the, our views of disability, but also globally, what's the view of disability. So the UN Convention, it was a turning point in my life. I actually had the opportunity to go to this, this convention where there were over 300 world leaders and they were talking about what they were doing in their nations that addressed the issues of discrimination for people with disabilities in their countries. And so they have this, um, this article and this is how they define disability as um, a person with a mental, physical, intellectual, sensory impairment who where interactions with various barriers may hinder their full potential and their participation in society. And this is like eight articles. It's a very cool book to read, but it's also cool to listen to how this is implemented in developing countries across the world. And here are the areas where people are really discriminated against. And it happens in America, but more so in developing countries. Many, many people with disabilities do not have the act, do not get access to even a primary school education. Um, for some countries, like my, my island of Antigua, if a child is not potty trained, an adult, a teenager, they can't go to school. So what happens? They do not get access to education. Um, here in America, here's the biggest challenge, employment, right? So you have, we had all this crisis and people were laid off. And believe it or not, people with disabilities are the ones who, for the most part, they stay in those jobs because they're committed to those jobs. And that's, their life is their work. And so you will have a lot of sustainability, people working in their job 15, 20 years because that's, that's their commitment. And a number of them live in poverty. So I have a little bit of statistics for you. I am not the greatest mathematician. So I will try my best to calculate. Um, so 
like I said, I did a lot of my report, my, my, my research from the World Health Organization and actually the U.S. Census. And so, based on the World Health Organization, 15.3% of people with disabilities worldwide. And we have over 6 billion people, right? Well, that's what I heard last. I can't calculate how many millions those are. But that's a lot of people. And what does that entail? So we're thinking about, when we think about disability, the first thing I think a lot of people comes to mind, when you think about somebody with a disability, you think about somebody in a wheelchair, right? Or you think about somebody with a cane. But this is a whole group of people. And this, this group, disability group, this group of underrepresented people is one of the underrepresented groups that any one of you, including myself, can join at any time. Joni Erickson Todd will be here tomorrow. And I'm sure she will tell us his story. But I've been reviewing her, her curriculum, and one of the stories she talks about um, is this colleague of hers who went to bed, typical developing, a, she was an athlete, went to bed, and for some reason she was dreaming that she was diving off of doing swimming, so she was doing a dive. And she did her dive, but she didn't realize she was sleeping. So she dove off of her bed and she broke her neck. She's paralyzed today. Many people who, um, for whatever reason, chronic illness, aging is a big one. We think, oh, that's so far down the line. I thought that was yesterday, right? And now look at me. And so things change in an instant. So one, if you've ever broken a leg or broken an arm, you realize, man, I needed that arm, right? Or how do I get up, how do I navigate these stairs? So these are the things that you either experience or you will experience at some point in your life. And so here is some more data. Um, I check it out here. Okay, so I wanted to note this 12.5% of college students that self-report. Um, so actually there's about 84 million, that's what they say of people with disabilities. But of this 12.5% of college students who self-diagnose, there's another half of those that don't. So in reality, it's about 25% of those students who don't disclose. And I have to speed it up a little bit here. And so we did talk a little bit about how many people are the people with disabilities because of the 12.5% of, the of people in the U.S. alone with disabilities, 10% of them have invisible disabilities. That means that they look typical. And you look at them and like, well, you don't look like you have a disability. But although they don't look like it, their challenges, their struggles, their impairments are still very real. And here is a list of some of those that we experience here at, at Bethel and just overall. So I'm going to skip some of the discrimination stuff um, simply for a lack of time because I want to get to um, the barriers and why this is important for us to include um, disability as a part of the diversity paradigm. So when we think about barriers, there are several. And I love this little quote that the attitudes are the real disability. Because believe it or not, that's the real challenge. When we think about barriers, we think about that person standing or in a wheelchair and can't get upstairs because there's no elevator. But there are many other ways that there are barriers. So information for a person with a visual impairment and maybe the text is too small. I experienced that. And when you get older, and you will, you will have to get some glasses and bifocals and all those great things so that you can all of a sudden read. And my son, one day, he looked at my phone, he's like, Mom, why is their font so big? I'm like, because I can't see. Anyways, and so those are some of the things. And then here's the other one, communication. So for deaf individuals, they need to have, without an, an ASL interpreter, or they're in a classroom, and all, one of the expectations is to watch a video, but there's no closed caption. That's a barrier. So they need to have access to that. Technological, we talked a little bit about accessing websites for a person who is visually impaired and can't navigate without a screen reader. A 
organizational, there's just some other ones that we have set up institutionally, some barriers, because we think this is a criteria based on the norm. This is what is expected of this type of student. And so we set these, these barriers up, this classroom, this, this lecture, with that in mind and not thinking about the others. And we did talk about the structural ones. So let's talk about diversity. So here, here is my, my caveat. When we, we really focus on a culture of diversity, guess what? We all benefit from that. Um, people with disabilities have so much to give and so much to, they represent so much of, of what we do. I'm not a great, um, what is that dancing show? Dancing with the Stars. Anybody watch that show? Okay. I don't really watch it, but for some reason I was kind of captured by it this week. And there was a dancer who I noticed was a double amputee. And she was doing the swing dance. And they were, now I don't know if you guys know what that, but that's a really fast dance. And it was just amazing watching her. And one of the things that she said, and she taught the person that was teaching her the moves, was that it's not about what I can do, or I don't have, or I do have but what I can get. And Pastor Emery yesterday did that so so graciously. It's about how God is going to use that gift. And maybe it is through what we consider suffering or difficulty. That's when we have a voice. That's when we have a testimony. When I started this job here at Bethel, I was a mom of a parents with disability, of kids with disabilities. I've worked in the deaf community for a long time. But I am now experiencing this myself as a person with a disability and how do I define my new normal? What does that mean to now have to disclose, okay, people will now see that I have an accessible sticker on my card. So those are the things that we all can be a part of. But does that mean that we don't contribute to society? Of course not. Temple Grandin is one of my very favorite um, speakers and Time Magazine labeled her as one of the most influential people in the world. Mm -hmm. Do you guys know who Temple Grandin is? Okay, so Temple Grandin was born on the autism spectrum. She didn't talk until she was four years old. They told her mom she would be institutionalized for the rest of her life. Temple has written several, several books, and she has changed so much about, and talked so much about um, people with disabilities that we, we see today, we don't know they have disabilities. So this is a book that she co-wrote and it talks about people like Albert Einstein. We hear about him all the time, right? Did you know that he was on the autism spectrum? He had Asperger's. But we hear about him. We don't hear about the Asperger's part. We hear about, you know, this great smart guy. So why should we care about this stuff in Bethel? Well, our core values say that we should, right? <laughs> and so this is why it's important. So I want you to think about, a lot of times we think about diversity and we think, Okay, that means race, that means culture. Well, I tend to differ because it's not about just race and culture. It's about gender, it's about ability. It's about all the other things that we, we all the groups of people, people who, who are second language, English second language learners, um, people who are international that we are discriminated against because of those things, they're marginalized because of those things. So where do we begin? Now, uh, there is a flyer that all of you should have that talks about the universal design for learning. And there is a little video clip, but I don't have time to show it right now. But basically what it does, it talks about the three ways that we can create an environment that would not only make work less for me, but it, it, it captures all of the underrepresented groups and provides the same opportunities for all of them. So, particularly in our classroom settings, providing multiple means of, of representing what it is that you're trying to teach. That, those are the what's of learning. What's it, what is it that you want students to learn? Some, in some, some there is, uh, it's called backwards design. For some that you've heard, and I know that there are some faculty here and they've heard of that. What's the objective? What is it that students need to learn? And then, what are some multiple ways that you can do that? Throw it in a video, a group discussion. Some students are really great at that. Some are really good at just listening. So using multiple ways of presenting the information. The, the second one 
is also to provide multiple ways of expressing what it is that they're learning. We're so, I, now this is just Natalie talking. If, and I should say this very quietly, but I hate tests, okay? Uh, but I, I do my best work on paper, writing paper, and I know many students are the same way. But are there other ways that you can assess how great somebody is doing, how they're understanding what it is that you're teaching? Those are some of the things to explore. Who says that we have to do a test? Who says that we have to time the test? You know, those are some of the things we need to think about. What are some other ways that students can express what they learn? How can they show you that they have learned that information? And the third one is provide multiple means of engagement. So that is including people from different cultures, people with disabilities, people from different ethnicities who bring a different perspective, but a lot of times we don't hear those voices. We hear those people who, and I am not one of those, believe it or not, who in a classroom, I'm like a, a mouse. I don't say anything. But that doesn't mean I don't have stuff to say. And many people like me are introverts and we don't get our voices heard. So providing multiple ways that students can engage, whether they're, they're extroverts and love talking or they're introverts, or maybe they're cognizant of their, their dialect, which is one of the things that I intentionally try to get rid of so people won't ask me where I'm from. And things like that. So these are the different ways that we have to think about. What is it that we want them to learn? Are there different ways they can do that? How we want them to learn? Are there different ways? And then why is that important? Because a lot of times, why do I need to learn algebra? How is that going to help me? But you can show how you can help. I have seven minutes. So why should we care? One, because we're Christ followers. And I, I don't know, this was, I know there is no such verse, and I did delete it, but for some reason it didn't change. But um, it's John, 1 John 3, 18. It said, let us love not with words or with our tongue. In Antigua, we say with lip service. Do you guys say have that term here? Okay, that means that you're not just saying we're an inclusive, we believe in, you know, rights for everybody and everybody's treated equally. But we need to do it in our actions. We need to do it in the classroom, in our teaching, in our every office that we go into, when we have new students on campus, all those things in our activities that we plan, we need to show talk the talk, right? And do the things that needs to be done. But secondly, because it's our human responsibility. There are so many people who are not represented, just not just here, but globally. Like I said, in an international context, when I actually just went to Antigua over the summer and talked to a group of parents and teachers about, about autism and said, I work with students who are in college who are on the autism spectrum. And therefore, they can't believe that's even possible. And those are the things that we need to think about. How can we make a difference? How can we make those changes? Now, this is one of Kitty's favorite quotes, and I, I say this in every presentation, I put it in there. Um, it says, every human life has its limitations. If you don't have one, you will get one, okay? Vulnerabilities and weaknesses, it's not just those with disabilities. So we all got our stuff we gotta deal with. So in truth, there is no such thing as a life without disability. And I love that, because that's the truth. How we deal with it is different. How people view it is different, but we hope to change some of those things. We have a responsibility because Christ gave us that responsibility to honor all people and to love everybody regardless to their gender, regardless to their age, because that's another ism, right? Um, regardless to their ability, their sexual orientation, all of those things, regardless to all of those things, we have a responsibility to love them because Christ did that and we are to emulate them. So how can you get involved? There are many, many ways. First, if you think, or there are some things, because I work not just with students, uh, but I work with employees as well, that you have a limitation that's impacting your work, that's impacting your academics, connect with my office. Sometimes it's just asking information. What, what does this mean? 
we are very happy to talk to you about some of those things to identify some of those those barriers and to suggest some things. Sometimes it's not even an accommodation that you need. It's a strategy or a couple of strategies. Um, and so you all have a brochure. You know we have our new website up. I don't know how many of you have had a chance to take a look at it, but it has a lot of information on there too. And I actually, some of our student workers were reviewing it and they were like, uh, I had one student say, this is me, this is me. And I was like, what's you? Because he was reading all this, you know, all the indicators and he was like, that, that sounds just like me. And so it has a lot of information. The second one is to participate in things that are happening. In disability, we have this, this tendency to preach to the choir. And only the people that are interested in disability stuff show up. But we have an obligation as a community to show up. Um, so we have, go see Joni tomorrow. And next week we're having an emphasis on autism awareness. Participate in those things. And you guys love dogs, so we're bringing them back. So you can come and pet the dogs too. And then here's the other kicker. Speak out. If you experience or you notice it, say something. Because a lot of times people don't say things that are discriminatory to be mean. They just don't know. And they want to know that it's the right thing. They're bold enough to say something, but sometimes it's not the right thing. You're not going to say it in criticism. You're not going to say it to be mean, but you're going to say this is hurtful. So one of the things I, I spoke to um, one of my colleagues, and I, she said something about a deaf mute. And I said, well, that's very discriminatory to deaf people. They don't like being called mutes. And she was like, really? And so she was like, thank you for telling me that, because I never knew that. So when you find an opportunity to educate, do that. And then finally, which is what I tell not just students I work with or employees that I work with, become knowledgeable of the laws. Know, particularly when you're experiencing these challenges yourself, Know what laws and how discrimination shows up where you, in your setting. Um, particularly because we are a residential campus, one of the things I have to be abreast of is the Fair Housing Act. And what does that mean for Bethel students with disabilities? So become knowledgeable of those things. Don't let people determine what's okay and what's not okay. Many students come in and they start talking and they're like, I felt discriminated against. I'm like, did you talk to the instructor? Did you talk to this coworker? And they didn't, they kept it all in. This is the time to educate. And so this is my last slide. <laughs> and this is what I want to propose to you. In my office, and you know for this whole week, we've talked about disability just being different. But it doesn't mean less than. I say that every time. Every student that walks into my office, every faculty, I think I say that so much that my kids say it just automatically. But that's my, my goal, to see that there is a difference. But here is the one that I want us to really emphasize, that disability is a part of diversity. It's not a silo. It's not a little box that you put people with specific things that make them different. That's not where we put them. It's a part of diversity. So that's what I want to be your takeaway that one, diverse, disability is a part of diversity, and two, this is, people with disabilities, they, they're simply different, they're not less. I have one minute, woo -hoo! So I know I, only, I have only one minute left, and I really flew this presentation, but if there are questions, I know I gave you a lot of information. I, have, I love talking to people about this stuff, but anybody have any burning questions? I know there's things, probably things about our processes. Our new website has a lot of information, but any questions, any? How do you get the students that don't report a disability to report it? So here's one of the things that I do. I, I really depend on the instructors, the people that work with them, the classmates, the roommates, who notice some of the things that you think, maybe you need to see somebody to encourage that person to come and talk to them. Maybe it is that you're leaving a brochure or you're leaving the website up, or have you heard about? Because at least 75% of the students that I meet with say, I never knew this office was here. And a lot of times they're coming in their senior year. So encouraging them, did you know about disability services? And that's a big thing. I really, really don't like the word disability, but unfortunately, I can't do a lot to change that because that's the norm right now. There are many institutions that have taken that completely out of their, their language. But that's one of the hang-ups that 
particularly there are some I would I would particularly those like with uh, chronic illness or whatever who would say I don't have a disability but those are some of the barriers so understanding that that there is a place that they can go and developing that trust which is one of the things that I really try to do I create an environment of trust and students come in hesitant I'm not doing anything with this disability services people and they leave and they're like thank you because they didn't know what to expect and they come in and we re really do a good job to show that we accept you who you are and your brain is just wired differently information goes through differently there's so many different things and so you letting me know sometimes you know instructors are a little hesitant about saying well you should go see Natalie disability services so let's talk about that if you have a student that you feel maybe you could benefit just let me know and we can figure out how some more ways to navigate that. So. Any other questions? Okay, well thank you so much for coming.